Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter 10, as Pastor David said, Hebrews 10. And I want to begin this morning, there, there's a lot of text to cover, so, and I'm not going to cover it all, but I do want to begin by reading the Word, say a prayer, and we're going to jump right into uh, the message today. So Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10, it says, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy." And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so, for he says, This is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I ask that in this moment, right now, that we have a a limited amount of time and a lot of information So I don't want us to miss what you might want to share with us today. So God, I pray that you just give me the ability to communicate and all the listeners the ears to hear what you might want to say to us all today. I humble myself before you and I ask that you would just be honored in our our time um, here this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you've been with us for a few weeks, we've been in this series called Greater Than. And we've been looking at this book of Hebrews, the first 10 chapters specifically. And we, on purpose, have been looking at Hebrews from about a 30,000-foot view. Because if you jump into it, go verse by verse, some of it can get confusing, a little bit concerning. But when you look back from a bird's eye view, if you will, you see the heart of the writer and what he's trying to convey to us, to the readers, right? He's trying to let us see the greatness of Jesus. In fact, there's no one greater. There's not another person. And there's not anything else that's greater than Jesus. And so just week after week, chapter after chapter, like a mosaic, he just keeps putting another piece there, and and you just have this beautiful picture of who Jesus is, and that's what we've been talking about all year, is when we understand who he is, and what he did, and what he teaches, it just means so much more to us, and so I hope that today as we cover uh, this last week in this series, Greater Than, that you're encouraged, maybe even challenged a little bit, but just how awesome God's plan for redemption is, and how awesome the sacrifice of Jesus is as well. Amen? All right, so he paints this beautiful picture throughout Hebrews, and um, I was thinking about picture, and he uses the word shadow and types, and I thought about, you know, when Rachel and I started dating a long time ago, I got her permission this morning, by the way, a long time ago we started dating, and one of the first things I did is like, man, she's a cute girl from Granite, we're 13 miles apart, so I don't get to see her all the time, so hey, do you think I could get a picture? And so she gives me this picture, and, and I carry it around along with a couple others, and I'm like, man, this is awesome. I show my buddies, my girlfriend, like, like check her out, dude. You get a picture up there? there she, isn't she cute? Look at that. Oh, it's just so sweet. And that picture, I carried it around, and I could show my friends. And when I wasn't with her, I could look at the picture and just go, ah, she's all mine, right? It was just special. And the pictures are awesome, aren't they? But they're incomplete. They're inadequate. One of the words for inadequate is lacking. And when you look at the picture, it's lacking something very important. It's lacking the reality that was Rachel in that season of life. It's like, man, going and being with the real Rachel was a whole lot better than the picture. Amen? It was lacking the scent of her perfume. It was lacking the touch of her hand. It was lacking the, you know, just the ambiance and maybe a little kissy, kissy, smoochy, smoochy. It was was just not complete. And so I bring that up because I think that's a great visual for what the writer is trying to convey to the readers. He's like, hey, all of this stuff that we've been talking about, the old system, the the priests, the prophets, the angels, all that is the picture. But the reality is found in Christ alone. That's the whole big idea of Hebrews chapters 1 through 10. Amen? So over the past few weeks, we said Jesus is greater than. He's greater than the prophets. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than the beloved leader Moses. He's greater than the high priests. And now he turns again to the sacrificial system, their system of worship, and he looks at the actual sacrifices that they were so familiar with every day. Around them, there was the smell uh, of death, the smell of a sacrifice. They understood blood. It was bloody. Now, for us in our culture today, we're like, that's kind of gross, isn't it? 
In fact, we used to sing a whole lot of songs in the hymnal about the blood of Jesus. Amen. You remember those songs? There is power in the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain drawn from Emmanuel's vein, a fountain of blood. We used to sing all those songs, but we, we understand in the gospel the importance of the blood, but it was a reality to them every day. They understood the sacrificial system, the animal sacrifice was a part of their life. For them, it was access because without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sins. So they knew it was very important that the sacrificial system was set up. And so go all the way back to even Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned and Jesus killed an animal, clothed them with an animal. Sacrifice was necessary to cover them. But specifically, chapter 12 of Exodus. I love this one because from here all the way forward to the life of Christ, there's a line drawn. Uh, because in chapter 12 of Exodus, we read about the Passover lamb um, and, and this ministry of the, the Passover. So they were in Egypt. They were slaves. And there were the ten plagues, right? You remember that? And the last plague was the plague of the, the death of the firstborn. And so what it looked like was, you know, Pharaoh wouldn't let the children of Israel go. His heart was hardened. And God says, I got one more thing we're going to do. And when I do this, I promise you, they're going to not only let you go, but they're going to encourage you to leave. And it was the plague of the firstborn. And so he said, I'm going to strike all of the firstborn uh, children, the animals, and all of that in Egypt. There will not be one family or one household that is not touched by this death. But here's what I want you to do. So to the children of Israel, he said, I want you to go out and I want you to grab a lamb. And it has to be without blemish. Okay? Get a lamb. Each family, each house has to do this. Get a lamb. And I want you to sacrifice or you're going to slaughter that lamb. You're going to roast it. It's going to be your Passover meal. But I want you to do something special with the blood. The blood of that lamb, I want you to take a, a branch of hyssop, right, like a paintbrush, and I want you to dip it in that blood, and I want you to go on the outside of your house on the threshold around the, the, the door there, and I want you to put blood on both sides and on the top. And here's what's going to happen. When the death angel comes through and wipes out all the enemies, all these false gods and all these people that are wicked, he's, when he does that, if you're inside the house, in fact, don't go outside, during this time, stay inside. But if you're in there, the death angel is going to come over and it says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Okay? And so this begins in Exodus chapter 12. We know that that did happen. And so Moses said, this is going to be something you're going to do for the rest of your lives. Every year, you're going to have a Passover meal to commemorate this. So every year, it's just a part of your life. In fact, you fast forward 1,300 years and now Jesus is walking among the people, right? And Jesus is observing Passover, the reminder that they had the Passover lamb that was sacrificed on behalf of the children of Israel. Jesus is now walking and observing that. And what God and his perfection is doing is like, here's the picture, but the reality is standing right in front of you. And the reality is Jesus is the Passover lamb as well. And so during the Passover, Jesus sets up the meal with his disciples and they're in the upper room and we know it is the last supper. But during the last supper, he says, here's the bread. Um, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he said, this cup is the blood of my new covenant. Drink this, do it in remembrance of me. And we know from history that Jesus died on a cross approximately the same time that the Passover lamb would have been killed in the sacrificial system. So two things going on at one time. An epic just revelation of the reality of who Jesus is. Are you with me so far? All right, so now the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, Jesus is greater. He's the greater sacrifice. Uh, all this other stuff is the picture, but the reality is in, in Jesus. And so he begins to make his claim that Jesus is greater. And so let's look at three different ways that Jesus as a sacrifice is greater. First off, there's the covenant. So the covenant, the old covenant was confirmed by blood by Moses in the old temple and tabernacle. In fact, every piece of furniture in the tabernacle had to be cleansed with blood. And they would sprinkle the blood. Once a year, they would go in. The, the priest would have to go behind the veil, the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat or the seat of atonement, and they would get their forgiveness for the year. Everything was cleansed with blood. And so the blood confirmed the covenant, the old covenant with the people. But it was the old covenant. And there were a lot of regulations that went along with that covenant. In chapter 9, it says of the rules of worship, he says, the first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place on earth to worship. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room was a lampstand, a table, all this furniture, right? And he says, and there was a second room. Oh, let me find where I'm at. Da -da 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 -da. 
Above that, the chair rooms. The second room, verse 3. Then there was a curtain, and behind the curtain was a second room called the Most Holy Place. In that room, there was the gold incense, the altar, the wooden, some more stuff. And above the ark were the cherubim of the divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the ark of the covenant, the place of atonement. He says, but I can't explain all this to you right now. I'd love to get into this, but I need to get on to the main point of what I want to share with you. And so he says, verse 6, when these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered this first room as they performed their religious duties, but only the high priest, only the high priest entered the most holy place and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people um, who had committed those sins in ignorance. And so by these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance of the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. So this old covenant confirmed with blood in use, he said, all this other stuff couldn't be done until this one was um, obsolete. <clears throat> and so they had these religious regulations for worship. But one thing I want you to notice about that was the limited access from the regular people. Because in the old system, it said in that tabernacle, there was the Holy of Holies, and only one person went behind that curtain in the Holy of Holies. And that was the high priest, and he only did it once a year. And before he went behind that curtain, he had to make sure he offered a sacrifice for his own sins before he could offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. That was the old system, right? And so once a year, the high priest would go there. It was limited beyond the curtain. No one could see into the holy of holies. And so it was limited. It was insufficient. It was inadequate. It was lacking the old covenant. And so Jesus is the greater sacrifice because he instills or confirms a new covenant also confirmed with his blood so in the upper room he said this is the new covenant that is confirmed with my blood do this in remembrance of me and so prophesied in um hebrews or excuse me in jeremiah <clears throat> it's found in chapter eight so i'm gonna back up a little bit it says the day is coming says the lord this is jeremiah prophesying when i will make a new covenant with the people of israel and judah this covenant will not be like the old one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with my people, uh, or the people of Israel, on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. Then I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, and I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means that he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. And so Jesus... It's a greater sacrifice because he confirms a better covenant. Aren't you thankful for the New Testament? Aren't you thankful that we don't live according to the old law, the dietary law? Some of us would be in really bad shape because I like pork chops. <clears throat> so he's uh, better because it's a better new covenant. He's also the greater. Jesus is greater because he's the greater sacrifice. Uh, look at chapter 9, verse 16. <clears throat> in that he speaks of, well, let me back up to verse 12. It says, let me back up to verse 11. Like I said, there's so much here. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. So we talked about the high priest last week. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of the created world, with his own blood, not the blood of the goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Amen? So uh, verse 23 says, that is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies, a picture of the things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. For Christ did not enter the holy place made with human hands, but was only a copy, a picture of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth, who enters the most holy place year after year, 
with the blood of an animal, if that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. So in the Old Testament, the old system that they were so used to, the priest would offer sacrifices regularly in the earthly temple, which is a picture of the real one in heaven. And the high priest would always offer sacrifices on behalf of the people, but those sacrifices were always, always animals. Okay? Jesus fills a unique role because not only is he the great high priest, but he also offers himself as the sacrifice. So as high priest, he offers himself as the sacrifice, the far greater sacrifice. What does the word say? Greater love has no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. Aren't you grateful that Jesus will lay down his life for us? So Jesus is greater because he is far greater sacrifice. Lastly, he's greater because his effect, the, the, the work that he did, um, is much greater than the work that the high priest could offer. Notice that the high priest regularly, over and over and over again, every year, regularly, they offered the sacrifices of the animals. And it says that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. Remember when Jesus was walking up to John in the New Testament, and he wanted to be baptized by John, and John said, hey, look, that's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The Passover Lamb. He's as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And so the high priest is offering it over and over and over again. What does it say of Jesus as the high priest? Once he offered himself as a sacrifice, he sat down. I love that. Because sitting down means the work is finished, right? That the sacrifice was sufficient once for all time. And as a high priest with a perfect sacrifice, he did the work of redemption and he sat down at the place of honor at the right hand of God. Uh, the animal sacrifice is only covered temporarily. Jesus' sacrifice takes away the sins of the world. I want you to consider this for a moment. Jesus, when he was crucified, it says that it was during the Passover time. <clears throat> and it says, when Jesus shouted, it says, you know, the whole place turned dark for about three hours. And Jesus shouted. Some thought he was hollering for Elijah. And they said, let's, let's see if Elijah comes. And Jesus, it says, when he shouted out again and released his spirit, it says, at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Matthew wants to make sure that we know this was the work of God and not man. That from the top to the bottom, that curtain that denied access to everybody else but a high priest once a year was now torn from the top to the bottom, signaling that there's now great access to the God in heaven. How cool, how cool is that? And all of this is done through Jesus. He's greater than the prophets, greater than the angels, Greater than Moses, he's the greater than the high priest, and his sacrifice is the greatest. So what does all of this mean? Read on. It says in verse 19 of chapter 10, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I mean, consider what he's saying to us. He's revealing this mosaic, if you will, this mosaic picture of Jesus. And he says, I want you to, brothers and sisters, think about this. We can boldly, boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Not because of our good works. Not because of religion. He says we can boldly enter because of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us, there's an invitation, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. I love that. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed <clears throat> with pure water. He goes on to say in verse 23, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. What he's saying is like, hey, listen, it's all about Jesus and you need to hold on tight to Jesus because Jesus is not gonna come back with, there's gonna be a Jesus 2.0, there's not gonna be another sacrifice, another opportunity, it's all about Jesus and no other name under heaven has been given by which men may be saved and that is through Jesus Christ, right? So let us hold tightly to the hope that we have in Jesus. This hope goes beyond the veil. It's anchored in Christ, and it's a great, solid hope. He says, let's hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. These are people who were on the threshold of going back to an old system that was now obsolete because they were being persecuted. This is like, hold on tightly to the hope because God who promises is faithful. 
Verse 24, let us think of ways to motivate one another to the acts of love and good works. I mean, that's a good message for today, isn't it? As brothers and sisters to motivate one another onto acts of love and good works. In verse 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You see, they were tempted to go back to an old system that was now obsolete. It was the, the picture, the reality was in Christ. And because of heavy persecution, they were tempted to walk away from the fellowship. And he says, hey, don't, don't neglect the meeting. We need each other. Don't neglect the gathering together of the saints as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. So I ask you a question, what, what does all this mean? What does it mean? Everything. Church, and I hope we don't miss this, because as we said all, I mean, all year we've been looking at this theme, like who he is, what he did, what he taught, what it means. And when you truly understand who he is and what he did, what he accomplished, church, it should put a spring in our step. It should change the way we approach worship. It should change the way we live our lives. You know, as Ephesians 4, 1 says, to live a life worthy of the calling that we've been called to, it makes all the difference in the world. Amen? And so Jesus is greater. He's the, the greater sacrifice. Through him we have now access to the Father because of him. And so there's this warning, as there has been all through Hebrews, and the warning is basically like, don't neglect this great salvation because there's not going to be a, a second chance, another opportunity for salvation. Uh, there's not going to be another Savior to come down. And, do, and Jesus is not going to come back either and go to the cross over and over and over again. By one sacrifice, he made perfect forever those who trust in him for salvation, right? So don't neglect this salvation, but go on to Jesus. That's the warning in a nutshell all through Hebrews, Jesus only. Don't settle for the picture. Don't settle for the shadow. Don't settle, settle for the typology. All of that was pointing to the reality that is now, from our perspective, duh, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. But from their perspective, they're like, man, I don't know. This is getting hard. And let's go back to church. And like, hey, church is obsolete now. Jesus fulfilled all of that. That's the picture. He's the reality. And I think, I think the same message is true for us. Don't accept anything other than the reality that is Jesus Christ. Don't, don't accept something that says, hey, if you just live a certain way, you know, like the, the life is like a set of scales, and at the end of my life, I can, you know, stand before God, and my good is hopefully going to outweigh my bad. I just got a, a, a reality check for all of us. The Bible says that our righteousness is like filthy rags compared to him. So on your best day, that's not going to play. It's not going to work. On my best day, that's not going to work, Right? And so my only hope is to trust in Jesus. Let me, let me just make another link between Exodus 12 and, and, and the reality that it's Jesus. In Exodus 12, he says, put the blood on the outside of the doorpost, stay inside. I mean, if you step outside the door, that one's on you. But if you're inside, when the death angel comes over, he sees the blood of Jesus. We're looking at it forward. He sees the blood of the lamb. He'll pass over you. I bet you there were some scoundrels inside that house. I bet. I bet there were some jacked up people inside some of those houses. But the reality is, is what saved them, what protected them, was not their righteousness, their goodness, but it was the slain blood of a Passover lamb. Church, can I just tell you right now, Jesus is everything. And the only way we're made right with him is by applying the blood of the Passover lamb. Jesus, our Passover lamb. How do we do that? By faith, Right? We, we trust that he is the great sacrifice, that he died on the cross for the sins of the world. We recognize our need for a savior and we're like, God, I, I admit it, I'm a sinner and I believe in the gospel and I'm trusting in him to make me right with you. And so would you apply his blood to my account? We call that appropriation. You, you appropriate it to your life by faith. So we place our faith in Jesus. It makes all the difference in the world. I don't know about you, church, but that should, that should do something in you. That should do something in each one of us, shouldn't it? Think of how apathetic we can be sometimes. We can just kind of go through life, going through the motions. We can take for granted, like football analogy, we can take for granted how awesome our team is until they stink it up really bad in one game. We can take for granted this right here. That we live, train and all, I don't even care. We, we get to gather here on Sunday and worship the living God every Sunday. Well, I don't know if I'm feeling it today. Or we come and we're like, eh, I'm just kind of going through the motions. But I think we take it for granted. I do. And I'm the pastor. Confession. Fire me. I need a break. But the reality is, 
I think all of us do that from time to time, don't you? Just take for granted how precious, how precious the gospel is and what he's done for, for us. I think it ought to spur within us this sense of encouragement to know that, wow, you mean I've got access to the holy of holies now, to the presence of God because, not because you're good enough, but because of what Jesus did? Mm-hmm, that's what it said. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I don't know about you, church, but I'm encouraged. And so this is what it is. Jesus' sacrifice has made all others obsolete. All of them. Every other sacrifice obsolete because Jesus has rendered it useless. He alone, his sacrifice alone is the full, full payment for our sins. That's good news, isn't it, church? So the question is, have you placed your faith in Jesus? Have you trusted in his sacrifice and that he is able to make you right with God the Father? Not because of your good works, not because of your church attendance or anything else, but I'm trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground. All other ground is sinking Saying the question is, are you standing on a solid foundation of Jesus as Savior? Most important decision you'll make. Are you here today? Like I'm a believer. I, I, I hope that we're challenged in our walk. You know, I was thinking about this, and I wouldn't. I didn't share it with the first service, but you know, Rachel and I got married in '93, and we we dressed up. I was wearing a white tuxedo, looked goofy, but I was wearing it, and I was about this skinny. But we 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 stood there, and that ceremony, the symbolism there was like two becoming one. It's a beautiful picture, right? Church, Christ, the groom, bridegroom. Just imagine every time that I disappointed Rachel, which I'm going to be honest with you, it was a lot of times, or when she let me down, that if we had to redo that whole ceremony over and over again, you know how tiresome that would be? Dressed up, go back to church, we got to do it all over again. We know that that's not the case, right? We, we made a covenant with one another. We are one in God's eyes. And when we screw up, I mean, we're going to screw up. But when we do that, we, we have grace with one another. And we come and we confess, hey, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. There, I think the same thing is true for us to get today when it comes to those of us who have placed our faith in Christ. You're going to screw up. You're going to sin. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Here's what he doesn't need to do. He doesn't need to come out of his throne in heaven, come back to the earth, grab a cross, go back to the place of death, skull, Golgotha, and do all that over again. I wouldn't want him to go through that again, would you? What a beautiful, beautiful gospel, beautiful picture of Jesus that the writer of Hebrews has presented to us, and all scripture for that matter, and so if we don't get anything else out of any of this, just know this, there's no one greater than Jesus. No one. And there's nothing that will ever be greater than Jesus. He is everything. Amen? Is he your everything? Father, I ask that you would just please search our hearts. Lord, you know the real us. You know beyond the surface and beyond the show and the mask. You see our hearts. And you know those that are yours. And I just pray right now, Lord, in this moment, we would just catch a glimpse of how amazing, how beautiful your son Jesus is and what he's accomplished on our behalf. And God, I pray that in that moment, we would see ourselves in light of that and, and recognize our great need, our imminent need, Lord, to trust in you for salvation because there is no other hope. There's no other way. There's no other sacrifice. Lord, Jesus is everything, and we, we see that today, and I pray that if there be anyone here that has not placed their faith in you personally, trusting you for salvation, that today would be the day that they say, yes, Lord, I trust you. I trust what you did, and I want to follow and commit my life to you. Father, for the rest of us that have placed our faith in you, I pray that you would encourage us today. Help us to not take for granted such a beautiful, beautiful sacrifice that was made for us. I pray that it's evident in our speech that it's evident in our attendance and worship and our worship in general as we're worshiping you, Lord, that it would be seen in our faces. People on the outside looking in would say, there's something different about those people. I just am crazy enough to think that the more we know about you and the more we understand what you've done for us, we ought to be goofy happy. Lord, we ought to be just full of joy and Lord, filled with just enthusiasm 
because we know, Lord, that we belong to you. We know that we live in this earth, and this earth is crazy. And so in the meantime, we need each other. We need to encourage one another, build each other up. Lord, remain faithful. Lord, hold and tight to the hope that we have in you, knowing that there's no other, there's no other hope. And Father, one day when we see it all, Lord, right now we have the picture, Scripture. One day we'll see it in, in reality, and what an amazing day that will be to stand before Jesus, maybe even get to touch the, the hands that were nailed to the cross. Lord, to hear him hopefully say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we ask that you would just please help us to live our lives in light of that truth today. We humbly ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.